Good to see Pastor Miller down here. Matthew chapter 9. I do note that your theme. Can you pass me a program? I do note that your theme comes from 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. I am not ignoring it. Perhaps it's not perhaps, it is absolutely the inspiration Amen. for what I have to share with you today. If you are in Matthew chapter 9, I'd like you just to focus for the moment on verses 35 and 36. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching in, uh, the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Amen. Amen. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. The Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Thank you. For those of you who just thought of God's word, your theme, God's messengers, comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 again, verses 2 and 3. We give thanks to God, Paul yeah. writes. To the church at Thessalonica. Yeah. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Amen. Amen. Certainly I see that as an expression from the church mm -hmm. of your appreciation and affection for your pastor and his wife. Okay. And I want to commend and thank you uh, for this time of celebration. As I understand it, there's only been maybe one other like this. So certainly I am humbled and honored that on this particular occasion, and I know you have lots of choices, Amen. that you are allowing us to bring the word. Um, I just want to say about the Harpers, that you are a mighty couple in God. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. And uh, God has delighted so many through you, continues to do so. You bring such joy and strength uh, to the presence and to the lives of those you grace. So thank you. Thank you very much for your years of service. Amen. With which I believe God is well pleased. And you have an incalculable reward waiting for you. That's right. In the right. Praise him. Praise him. Today I want to come and encourage you, Pastor Harper and Sister Harper. I do want to be an encouragement to you. I'm inspired by 1 Thessalonians. And just let me say this by way of that particular text. You know, Paul and, and his crew were chased out of Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. So they left not under the best of circumstances. And this letter is actually written, I believe, out of a sense of concern. So let me just say this, that when they left Thessalonica, we have reason to believe, I believe it's in the book of Acts, maybe chapter 17, where it talks about them, you know, kind of ministering to the group for the space of a legal something like three Sabbaths. We don't know exactly how long they were there, but we know that their leaving was abrupt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And upon their exiting uh, Thessalonica, lots of things began to happen, and the church there that had been established was really under, uh, under pressure. Mm -hmm. They were getting it from various sides. They were getting it from the pagans who didn't understand this new religion and were generally unaccepting of it. They were getting it from the Jews who, again, didn't understand this new religion and were generally unaccepting of it. And there were those who uh, were teaching heretical doctrines and a lot of things were going on, but the testimony that the church had was that instead of struggling and uh, waning in strength, they were actually growing in strength. Yeah. Right. And in love. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that encouraged Paul. He writes the letter to encourage them, to strengthen them, and as a continuation of his teaching, mm -hmm. the church has always had to uh, bear up under the strain of cultures that did not warmly receive her. All right. Our age isn't the first age to reject Christ. Mm -hmm. And I can argue for those of us here in America that we haven't seen the worst of it. All right. Amen. Certainly it unsettles us when they don't want us in or God's word in the courthouse in the form of the Ten Commandments. It unsettles us when uh, we're challenged about prayer in school. We don't like any of that, but it is nothing close to the historical persecution that the church oh, has experienced. Where men and women have actually died in defense of the gospel. All right. Thessalonica proves that when it comes to the church, its foundation is sure, and the gates of hell shall not prevail, not prevail. against it. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. God is on our side. All, right. All, right. All things work together for our good Love because Love 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 we love the Lord. Yes, sir. And are called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. When I was reading your theme scripture, I started to think about Paul. And the fact that he had left the church abruptly, and I know that he was concerned, certainly I would be. Concerned for these people that I dearly loved. I would ask myself, did I, did I give them enough before I left? Did they have enough of a doctrinal foundation to work with upon my departure. I wonder how they're doing. So it, it was good tidings to receive the news that they were doing well. And he found that through writing them, he could continue his work in their midst. And I started thinking about that kind of heart, that the connection he must have had to the people. Right? Yes. 20 years of ministry is no joke. Right, that, that puts a pastor in the minority when you last 20 minutes. And notice I used the word last. It takes a certain amount of endurance, yes. perseverance, mm -hmm. commitment, and devotion yes, sir. to pastor people. Come on, man. Now, I'm not going to go down that treacherous road of putting people down because, yes, it's hard to lead. It's hard for everybody to lead. Hard for CEOs to lead. Hard for school principals to lead. Leadership is always a difficult task. Because people are unique and have their different perspectives and understandings. And so I don't want to stand up here and make it sound like church is an arduous task for the pastor and all you do is beat folks down. That's not really what it's about. But it is about a heart that, that, that is so given to God's work and purpose. A heart that is tender and supple and sensitive to other suffering. Indeed, it's the heart of God. Right. I believe it's the prophet who carries the words of God, who is encouraging his people, who actually he's about to punish, and yet with the tender hand, he wants to say to them that, you know, if you get right and do right, I'm going to send you shepherds who are after my heart. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. We read in the scripture of David, who it is said of that he, he was a man after God's own heart. Right? Which is to say to us that we can have God's heart. Uh -huh. And when it comes to those who lead and speak to God's people, Listen. it is his desire that they carry his heart. Yeah. Right. The tender heart of the leader is actually God's heart. And as pastors, how many pastors do we have in the house? Raise your hand again. Oh, praise the Lord. So you can say amen, all right? <laughs> As pastors, our hearts are for God's people. Yes, sir. Amen. We don't just want the best for you. We want God's best for you. Right. And even when you're suffering, even when you're going through, 
It's our heart that you will know that God is still on your side. Praise man. Praise. And that whether it's on this side or the other side, it's all going to work out for your good. Amen. We want to see you grow. We want to see you prosper. We want to see you be everything that God has created you to be. Mm -hmm. And if a godly pastor, that is a pastor who's carrying God's heart, if he does become frustrated, it's, it's only because he understands that there's better for us. Amen. Amen. Folks don't understand that Christ had an emotional life. All right. We'll get to it in a minute. Mm. Christ had an emotional life. Amen. He loved God's people, but God's people frustrated him sometimes. Yeah. And in our wanting to project God as being all love, mm -hmm. all mercy, and all compassion, we forget the edge that Christ had on it. Mm -hmm. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say Christ had an edge on him? All right. Christ had an edge on him. Yeah. Remember that night they woke him up? <laughs> the Bible says that he was lying down the lower part of the ship and he was asleep. It had already set us up to know that he was dog tired. They saw that he was dog tired. They fashioned a pillow for him, made him a makeshift bed and let him take a nap. But the boat began to rock because the waters were rough. Yes, sir. And after they had done everything they could to resolve the situation, they decided to go down to Jesus, and they were frustrated. Mm -hmm. Because you know y'all get frustrated with us sometimes. Yes, sir. Master, carest not thou that we perish? Listen to the insolence in the words. Listen to the presumption. Listen to the haughtiness. Don't you feel what's going on? Hello. Hello. Many of you feel like that sometimes, like the Lord doesn't feel what you're going through. Mm -hmm. What does Jesus do in his response? Mm -hmm. Have I been with your soul long? All this good teaching and all this good preaching. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes you still struggle to believe. But because he is the model for a shepherd with the heart of God, even in his vexation, even in his frustration, puts himself together, rubs the sleep from his eyes, spills from the corners of his mouth, fixes his clothes, stands to his feet, goes topside. He speaks to the elements. Peace. Because the heart of God is that way. It's, it, on the one hand, God will, God will chastise us. Yes. In the words of the King James, he, he will discomfit us. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes, sir. Rustle us and shake us and move us about. He will allow oppression to come upon us. God will punish us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then with the other hand, mm -hmm. even as he's punishing us, he's comforting us. Yes. Yes. I, I, I'm not afraid to say, I, I want to tell a story that it's, it's Pastor Reed's story, but I'm going to tell it. I think of God as being both parents. There's a part of God that's the mother and there's a part of God that's the father. The strong arm of God, the father, the tenderness of God, the nurturing of God, the mother. Pastor Reed tells a story about his brother being chastised. Notice he tells a story about his brother and not himself. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, throwing people under the bus. Amen. <laughs> he talks about his father chastising his brother and at one point putting his brother out the house. He puts his brother out the house and shuts the door behind him. The brother goes around to the back of the house. <laughs> and there at the back door, the mother meets him. What do you To give him some stuff to hold him over till the father lets him back in. <laughs> and yet, isn't it in the heart of God to, to be that same way with us? 
On the one hand, he's spanking us and chastising us, disciplining us, putting us back in line. But with the other hand, he's saying, it's going to be all right. Yes, sir. With the one hand, he's putting us out of the garden. With the other hand, he's saying, but. Amen. 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 With the one hand, he's letting the Chaldeans have his, their way with us. But with the other hand, he's saying, but. Mm -hmm. but. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Amen. And as pastors, Sometimes don't you feel that way where you, you, you want to just preach that message that's fire and brimstone and y'all need to get right and you're yes, sick. But so. with the other hand, you're saying, but God. Yes, sir. Work with it, man. He'll make it all. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9 is very interesting to me because Christ is doing what Christ does. Mm -hmm. And five is a transitional kind of passage that is taking us from one place to another place. And in that transition, the writer is saying to us, I want you to understand that to this point, Christ had been teaching, mm. preaching, mm -hmm. and healing. Yes, sir. That's right. He had been teaching, preaching, and healing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. If you go to chapter 15, and we won't go there now, but on your own, you can go to chapter 15, you'll find there that he had compassion too. There he had compassion on the hungry. Mm -hmm. The scripture said that he had been ministering to them for three days and they hadn't really been eating. And he told his disciples, we need right. to feed these right. folks. He had compassion right. on them because they were hungry. They were hungry. In Matthew chapter 20, he had compassion on two blind brothers mm -hmm. who were begging for healing. When Christ ministered, which is different than preaching. Yes. And I need us to understand today that it's not the pastor's job just to preach. Right. Mm -hmm. It is to minister. Yes, sir. All right. All right. And so, because God gives us his heart, we use every skill and every talent. We use every ability we can to deliver the power of God to your life. All right. How many pastors in the house have been job counselors? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marriage counselors. Mm -hmm. Council parents. Mm -hmm. huh? How many times have you have you stepped into different shoes depending on what the need of your congregant was? You you began to minister to them at the point of their need. Because that's what a pastor with the heart of God does. He meets us at the point we need to appreciate those who minister. Yes, to sir. Muzzle not the right. ox that tread. That's right. How many pastors in the house feel like you're treading out the corner? I see the calluses on your hand. All right. We bless the men of God who day in, day out, week in, week out, minister to us. Our pastors minister to us even when we're not looking. Pastors are on their knees. Hands clasped and head to the sky, mm -hmm. crying out to God for us. Mm -hmm. When they're not in our presence, they're considering the things we've shared with them, asking God to, we ask God to give us a word for you. Amen. On Sunday morning when we preach, we don't open up a notebook with pre-written manuscripts. Amen. Throughout the week, we've been listening for the voice of God to right. tell us what to say and how to say it. All right. Because our interest is not just coming here and preaching to you, but ministering to you. Amen. Amen. How many times have you as a pastor, I'm talking to the pastors again, how many times have you in the past, as a pastor been in the pulpit with a message prepared and God said to you, I need you to talk about yeah. Amen. 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 The heart of God. In the 15th chapter, he has compassion on the hungry. In the 20th chapter, he has compassion on the blind. But in the 9th chapter, there's a different interest. There's a different interest. When congregants come to us and they want us to pray that their rent get paid, That they get a job, 
that their sickness gets healed. Mm -hmm. When there's that kind of narrow focus, it's the, it's the shepherd's job to understand that there are greater needs in the sheep. Mm -hmm. Can I talk to you a moment about sheep? Mm -hmm. Sheep bleat. B-L-E-A-T. They bleat. They cry. Mm -hmm. And it is a scientific truth that there are very, some very specific things that make the sheep cry. Mm -hmm. Sheep cry when they're nervous. Mm -hmm. The buying of the sheep may indicate that they're nervous. Sheep cry when they're hungry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sheep cry when they're scared and sheep cry when they're tired. Mm -hmm. But even when they're tired, they sometimes don't have the instinct to go to sleep. They just buy. <laughs> <laughs> but the knowledgeable whoever that is sleeping and snoring wake them up <laughs> but the knowledgeable shepherd understands that there's a reason behind the bleeding of the sheep and he's not so moved by the buying as he is to get into the root of that bleeding or that cry. And that's how Christ was. He saw the multitudes in chapter 9. He saw the multitudes. He saw the crowd gathering. Now let me say something about Jesus and the crowd gathering. The reason why they gathered is because they saw something in Jesus that was special and unique. They were surrounded by religious men of the highest order. And the deepest religious learning. But they had never seen power like Christ. Christ had power. How do you know he had power? Well, if you read the first four chapters of Matthew, he was saying stuff that had never been said. And even if you read the balance of Matthew, he was, he was turning conventional wisdom on its ear. He would say things like, I know that you've heard it said that adultery is. And then he'd go on to say, but let me tell you what it really is. I know that you've heard it said that murder is, but let me tell you what it is. Because there's something about a man of God who bears the heart of God that when he delivers the word, he delivers it with power. And as soon as you hear it, you hear God. The woman that he met at the well, uh, he, he, I believe someone just mentioned it today where he talked about it. even the, the husband you have now is not your own. That woman didn't feel put down. She didn't feel judged. In fact, the Bible says she ran to town and said, come here a man yes, sir. who told me all whatever I did. Now, I tend to focus on the phrase, come here a man. Yes, sir. Because here's a woman who had known a lot of men. But this was the first real man. Something about power that attracts us. I believe that's why as a church you can celebrate your pastor today because you recognize in him something that's special. Amen. Yes. Special. Yes. That he demonstrates the power mm -hmm. of God. Yes. The teaching and the preaching of Christ was powerful and then it was followed up with the demonstration of power and that he healed yes. the sick. Yes. Well, with all that teaching and all that preaching and all that healing the sick, there was something much more pressing that moved Christ. Mm -hmm. When you look at the text in chapter 9, and you look at verse 35, it says, As he went about to the cities and the villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel and the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease, verse 36 says, But when he saw the multitudes. I just stopped by to say to us, and maybe this is more a message to, to pastors and preachers than anybody else, and I don't mind that, that church can't just be about preaching. Yeah. Church just can't be about programs. There is an underlying purpose to our gathering. Something that gives it credibility and power beyond the motions. 
beyond the, the programs, be, beyond the traditions of our devotions and our scripture readings mm -hmm. and our, our, our corporate prayers and our offerings. There's, there's something to this gathering. Something is happening right now. Mm. Though many here are gathered, only a few may be getting. All right. Mm. There is a spiritual transference that God has set up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. That has occurred throughout this service. And it didn't start when I stood up here. Mm. It started with the first song. Mm. Oh, yeah. As we were singing the songs of Zion, as, as prayers were going forth, as praise was going forth, the Lord was in the house to make something happen for us. Amen. And as the sheep were bleeding, because that's what we've been doing all service, we've been bleeding. Oh my God. We've been crying out. To, I heard the sister come up and say, it's been a hard year for me. She said, it's been a hard year for a lot of us. And the year ain't over yet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I want you to know that God hears us bleeding. Mm -hmm. He hears us crying out. Amen. He knows what's going on with our government. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. He knows. Lord, help me today. All right. Yes, Lord. He knows what's going on with our churches. Yes, right. When our congregations are dwindling and we can hardly find laborers to do the work. God knows what we're going through. All right. But he sends a word to his bleeding sheep. Oh, yeah. And the way that Christ conducts that word through him is he first notices with compassion the multitude. He first looks at the people. And I think this is really what I need to say to the pastors. We need to stop for a moment and look at God's people. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 We can look at the ledgers and notice that the offerings aren't sufficient. Mm -hmm. We can look at our buildings and notice that they're in disrepair. Mm -hmm. We can look at our communities and notice that they're struggling. But have you ever just stopped and looked at your people? All right. mm -hmm. Yes, they're all dressed up. Mm -hmm. Yes, they came to church. And I think sometimes we think success is getting people to the church. Mm -hmm. Christ knew better. He saw all of those people who had thronged to him. Come yes. on. Many of them he had touched and healed. He had preached to them and he had taught them. But yet what he saw were people who were scattered, yeah. vexed, and weary. All right. Yeah. As a pastor, I got to tell you, I got to be honest. When I look out, even at this congregation, when I look at the makeup and the suits and the dresses, I see vexation. I see weariness. I see the scatter. God hears your bleeding. He knows your crying. And he sent a word to you. What does Jesus do when he sees the multitude? He sees them being vexed. And he sees them being weary. He turns to his disciples. And this is what he says. The harvest truly is plentiful. Yes. But the labor is so Because you know what Christ sees when he looks at the people? He sees the harvest. He's seen that the corn has grown. And it's time to harvest the corn. But his fear is it's going to die on the stalk. Yes, Fall to the ground and rust. Because there are not enough people not there enough. to harvest those souls. Yes. What blesses the pastor, yes, are days like this. This is awesome. Amen. This is great. Yes, yes. To celebrate those who, who labor out of their hearts for us with the heart of God. This is Amen. wonderful. It's commanded. It's instructed. But if you really have the heart of God, you know what you really want? You want to see God's people put their hands on the plow. Yes, sir. All right. Great, man. Not just party in the field. Put your hands on the plow and push. Yes, sir. So what should our response be in these times? When churches are struggling, I just got to be real with you. Let's not pretend like it's not happening. Amen. Folks aren't coming through the doors like they used to. All right. Amen. Folks aren't serving like they used to. Amen. Even if you can get them in the church, it's the hardest thing sometimes to get them to serve. And look, I might be preaching to the choir today. So go and tell somebody else who needs to hear this. We're struggling. 
But Christ has encouragement for us. He tells us what to do. Yeah. He turns to his disciples and says, yes, the harvest is plenteous. And the labors are few. But here's what we need to do. Pray, pray to pray. God, pray. the Lord of the harvest. Oh, yes, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Yeah. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Right. Amen. Pastor, what are you going to do about these empty seats? Mm. Mm. <laughs> and as pastors, we feel stressed and pressured. i got to come up with something, something creative. i got to do something, something innovative. What can we do to win people in? What, what's a program? What's a, what's a plan? Let's get together, auxiliary heads. Let's, let's get together, deacons. Let's, let's talk about some strategy. Let's have a strategy session. Yeah. Notice Jesus doesn't say that. Yeah, right. He doesn't tell the disciples, let's have a strategy session. No. He doesn't say to the disciples, you all need to be more innovative. No. <laughs> he says this to them. I need you folks praying. Praying. I need you folks praying. Mm -hmm. Not playing. No. Yes, sir. Not playing. <laughs> Not playing. Because we can stand on this hill with all these folks and we can feel good about ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look what we done did. Look at all these people come to hear you preach. You sure is a good preacher. <laughs> pastor, we love you so much. You know our pastor can preach. Honey, he preached this morning. I know. He preached till the fire fell down. How was church today? Honey, pastor, preach. <laughs> who we going to get for the program? You need to get somebody who can preach. <laughs> but Christ's prescription for the church that struggles is not good preaching. <laughs> It's good praying. Yes, sir. Pray. Yes, sir. Success is not filling the house at a time like this. Success is filling this house at prayer time. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Good God. <laughs> Success in our churches is having our folks have a heart for prayer. Because it turns out that the heart of God is a heart that cries out and depends on God. Yes, sir. God knows he's the only answer only. for what woes us. All right. And his desire is that we cry out to him, cry out to the Lord of the harvest. And when we cry out, what do we ask for? Mm -hmm. Not more members in our congregations. <laughs> That's not what the heart of God cries for. It's more souls in the kingdom. All right. More souls in the kingdom. If we fill our houses of worship with more saved folks and less church members, we'll go a lot further. Thank God for a pastor who preaches the unmitigated gospel. And yes, sometimes it's going to sound rough. But Christ sometimes sounded rough when he turned to the Pharisees and called them hypocrites. You think that wasn't rough? When he beat them folks out the temple, you think that wasn't rough? It won't always soothe us. It, it won't always fall on our ears as being graceful. But when you have a man who has the heart of God, he delivers the heart of God. And sometimes that heart is to say, yeah, I know you're not sleeping with other people, but you're thinking about it, and that's wrong too. Right. Right. Help me, Holy Ghost. I, the heart of God says, yeah, you never killed somebody with a gun, but you're murdering folks every day with your lips. Christ had a way of cutting to the bone. And when you got yourself a real sanctified preacher, Preach, man. filled with the Holy Ghost, right. speaking from the heart of God, mm -hmm. he puts it right down the line, doesn't care who. So Christ says, I'm looking at the people and I see what's going on. They're struggling. Mm. And pastors, I think maybe my job was to stop by here today and say our people are struggling. Right. Yeah. Our people are struggling. Mm -hmm. 
And they're not struggling because our choirs aren't good enough. They're not struggling because we don't preach hard enough because Lord knows every Sunday morning we put our backs into it. How many of you leave your pulpit sweating? Mm -hmm. Have to change shirts before you get in your car. Mm -hmm. You're putting your back into it. They're not struggling because we're not preaching. They're not struggling because the choir isn't singing. Mm -hmm. You know why they're struggling? Because sin is a hard taskmaster. All right. All right. Sin is a hard taskmaster. Right. And when Jesus looks out at the people, what he sees are people heavy laden with sin. They're weary because of sin. And folks come to the church carrying their sins on their back, and they leave the church carrying their sins on the back. Oh, yeah. Some of us have come in with afflictions and addictions that are ungodly. And we're content to live that way. And somebody needs to stand at a sacred desk like this and say to us, Christ died for your sin. Yeah. And no matter how strong its grip, no matter how good it feels, smells, looks, sounds, sin will kill you. Oh, yeah. Amen. Sin will kill you sitting in a church pew. Yeah. Sin will kill you with a pseudo. Yeah. With an usher pseudo. With a deacon pseudo. With a preacher pseudo. Sin will kill you. Sin will kill you even with your beautiful voice. Sin will kill you with your sweet and kind spirit. Sin will kill you as a skillful businessman. Sin will still kill you. You can be the greatest parent in the world. You'll still die and go to hell without Jesus. Somebody needs to tell you that there is an answer for your addiction and your affliction. And it's receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord. And after you've watched all these folks on television talk to you about how to get your stuff back. And after you've sent your money to them and sold your seed so you can start your business, buy your house, find your man, find your woman. After you've done all that, you still need to hear, ain't nothing good gonna happen for you till you give your life to Jesus. All right. Thank you. And if your toes aren't sore somewhere when you leave church, something didn't go right. Because the word's an elevator, but it's also a mirror. It'll lift you up, but it'll also show you up. Yeah. My Lord. So when Christ speaks to the disciple and says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that God will send laborers, he isn't saying we need more people on this mountain. He's saying we need more people like me. Christ is saying, I need you all to pray that there are more people like me who see the people. Yeah. Who don't just show up and preach. They don't just show up and yeah. preach. Yeah. They don't just show up for a love offering. My Lord. My Lord. They don't just show up so they can be the first in line to eat when the food gets served. Lord, help me today. Honey, start the car. Because <laughs> <laughs> after we finish with all of our titles, preach, man. Preach. bishops, Elders, mm -hmm. pastors, mm -hmm. superintendents, mm -hmm. adjutants. Mm -hmm. When we're done with all our titles, you know what we are? Just one beggar telling another beggar yes. we're going to foul bread. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's all we are. Yes, we're, just, we're just people who were dying in our sins. Mm -hmm. Every man in this pulpit and in this audience who calls himself a pastor, you know we are? We're just sinners who found grace in God. Right. Who saved us from our sins and now we're saints. Right. Now we're saints because he saved us from our sins. And we have come back to tell you that you can be saved. Too. Yes, sir. Yes. Not only can you be saved, but God will make you a fisher of men. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I end on this note? We are saved to serve. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. And when he brings you up, he desires that you bring somebody up. All right. It's not just the pastor's job mm -hmm. to save people. Because here's a little secret. Maybe no one ever told you. So I'm going to tell you today before I leave. Pastors don't save nobody. And pastors can't preach nobody saved. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Wait a minute. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Wait for it. Don't rush. Don't rush. Don't rush. One more time. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Wait, wait. For it. Mm -hmm. You know what? That's like a good spoonful of gumbo with, with shrimp and crab meat. It is. The gospel is. Yes, sir. Yes. Not your good looking pastor no, with his no. fine rock. No. Nope. I'm not being personal. With his fine ride and fine wife and fine fan family, that's not the power. You know what the power is? What if we just sang the gospel on Sunday morning? I like Ty Tribbett too, some little bit. <laughs> but what if we just sang the gospel on Friday? What if we sang about the salvation of Jesus Christ, the power to save, to deliver, and to heal? What if we just said, what if we talked about Jesus on Sunday? What if we didn't give messages about a three-point plan to grow your business, but what if we gave messages about being saved? What if we went back to that? What if, what if when we pray, God from Zion. Yeah. We didn't pray to wow the crowd, but we prayed to touch heaven. Yeah. What if we did that? All right. When he talks about sending laborers, we have to understand where the text is going. It's, it's not just that more people would come in, mm -hmm. but more people with the heart of God. Amen. Give us two people with the heart of God, and they can do more than a hundred people. Amen. And that's why the Bible says one can set a thousand to flight. But notice what two will do. Two won't send two, set two thousand to flight. That's not the way the math works. Yes, sir. The more of God's people you get together, working together, collaborating together, the more that God does. I just made myself happy. Just thinking about it. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says if two or three are gathered together, it's touching on anything. Amen. God doesn't deal with numbers, He deals with quality. Yes. Quality. And what God wants us to have in our churches is more quality. Yes, sir. More quality. When you're standing on the mountainside, wherever you are, Compton, Los Angeles, Pasadena, Bell Garden, wherever you are, when you're standing on your mountain, surrounded by your multitude, See the need, yes. but don't just see the need. Mm. See how God wants you to meet the need, because yes. right. it ain't about you. Mm. Christ, who was the, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, yeah. stood upon that mountain and recognized the work wasn't solely his to do. All right. So I say this to you today. The work is not solely our pastors to do. Mm. Amen. Amen. We need to come together as the church we are not a corporation mm -hmm. did you hear what I just said mm -hmm. I know we're chartered by the state but we are not a corporation mm -hmm. there's only one CEO of the church Amen. and his name is Jesus Christ yeah. and we might have different congregations yeah. Yeah. and we might be in different buildings doing things slightly different ways but there's only one head of the church yeah. and his name is Jesus Christ and he died for our sins. Amen. He hung up on the cross for our sins. Amen. Jesus paid the price yes. for our sins. Amen. Went into the grave for three days. Yes. Three days he went into the grave. Yes. Folks thought all was lost. Mm. See, that's the thing about the church. Sometimes we sow stuff that disappears for a moment. Mm. And we get nervous because yeah. we've done some stuff and we don't see the direct results right away. But I want you to remember what happened with Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Three days. Three days, Three days he ran away. Mm. Yeah. They had given up. The disciples had yeah. went fishing again. Yes, sir. They thought it was done. Pretty but friend. early on the third day yes, morning. Right. That's where the church lives, man. Yeah. It lives early on the third day yeah. morning. Yeah. The Bible says there was a rumbling. Yeah. Because when God moves, everything moves. Right. You ever notice that? Right. My mom was special in that way. My mom would delay and take her a long time to get ready. We'd be wanting to go somewhere and she'd be all late. 
we sitting on the couch swinging our feet, waiting for mama to get ready. Right? And then when mom got ready, she acted like she was late. What y'all sitting there for? It's time to go. Early on the third day. All right, you got up. The church lives on Sunday morning, not Friday night. The church lives on Sunday morning. Not Friday night. Y'all know what I mean by that? Yeah. We're up, folks. Mm. We're up. Mm. And I thank God that we're up. Amen. And we're going to stay up. Because yeah. the Bible says the very gates of hell shall not, shall not prevail against us. Yes, sir. We got all we need to be successful. Because mm. we got Jesus. Mm. And that's all we need. Amen. Amen.